All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show, my favorite day today. We're going to be talking with each other the whole day today. Um, there are so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and yes, somebody had left a comment that Dr. Bean, you are allergic to cats. So of course I am allergic to cats, although we keep them very clean and neat and they are Bengal cats that are supposed to be hypoallergen. That is we were careful when we brought them that the cat should be hypoallergen. Even then, here we are. So please don't mind my uh, coughing. The second thing is uh, just a heads up. At least a few minutes ago, both Luffy and Kairi were just going nuts playing here. And uh, they were loud and they were running around. So you may hear some meows from cats and they're running around noises. So with this, Welcome, everyone. We have a lot to discuss, uh, as was the last time. I don't think I can continue all the way to all the Twitter questions. They are just too many. So we will cover as much as we can today, and then we'll continue tomorrow with those. So how is everyone doing? How is the thread? It is the lovely day today. I really enjoy uh, talking directly with the cool beans here. So France, France, stay frosty and safe. We have the tools to beat this bad girl. <laughs> Who is the bad girl? William, the COVID chemical that turns off nuclear defenses, could this chemical be useful in suppressing some kinds of autoimmune diseases? Could it be useful in suppressing re rejection during transplants? <clears throat> Good question. It actually prevents the production of interferon and the um, suppression of some of the genes in the cell that cause apoptosis or the death of the cell. So, of course, wherever we need to have less interferons or less tumor necrosis factor, for example, in case of tumors, that is where this can be useful. However, we already have stronger medicines that can do that. It is possible that we take this chemical and that works as well, meaning I'm not denying that it can be useful. Um, probably need to be tested more, but that's a great, uh, great idea. Mark France, Franks says, our hospitals are at a critical point. Uh, Mark, where are you located? So let's look at the, uh, so Zelena is saying, Mark Franks, I have the same question about the variant. So let's talk about the variant first. And uh, the reason for that is that I, the top comment on Twitter at this time is from Avox Coffee Bean, a very lovely, uh, cool bean. And his comment is about this as well. So I went over the discussion and the article, and I want to share some of the data with you to say, should we be fearful? Should we be afraid? Or should we not be afraid? Should we watch, uh, watch a little more? And so on. So let's do that. I saw Margaret McInnes here as well. Um, let me just quickly say her here. So good evening, Dr. Bean from Maine. Happy, from fr uh, happy Forum Friday. Good evening back to you, Margaret, as well. So let's start. Let's look at some of the things. Um, so of course, this is drbean.com and here the top of this twitter thread is avox coffee bean hello dr bean and luffy boris johnson the uk prime minister has said the new uk variant of the virus may be both more contagious and more deadly as much as 30 percent more deadly any thoughts so and then uh, so here is a news thing so let's look at that together so first, let's look at the UK data. To me, it seems like eventually we will have to do the data analysis once more. Remember, we had done this analysis once before, and I did not think that there was much change in terms of the death rate. Uh, we did see a faster spread, and that faster spread may have been because that was Christmas time and people were meeting, or that may have been because of the virus. But remember this, that if virus is even when it is more contagious, if people are not near each other, the virus is not going to be able to spread fast. So probably both things worked, that people were getting sick more and quickly from the new variant. And then they were 
moving around and talking with each other and, and meeting, and they were giving it to others, each other faster as well. So let's look at the data. So here, this is the, I didn't get a chance to put all that data together on top of each other and then do the analysis and download the Excel sheet and then do analysis. So I'm just going to do a more surface level analysis here. So daily new cases. So if you see, there is definitely a, a, a peak that has appeared. And this is started from, if you see here, somewhere in December, December 15 onwards. And then if you see, there is a peak that has continued on and we January 10 and so on. This could be the new variant. This could be the people meeting uh, over Christmas and New Year. This could be a combination of both. Then there is the death rate over here and here. To me, it seems like the death rate has actually correlated with the number of infections, more infections. But what I have not done is to actually pull the data together from their Excel sheets and then do the analysis like I had done before. So I'll do that analysis once more. Now, with this data in our mind that there is increased number of cases, and it seems that there are more deaths as well. And of course, if the numbers are increased and the even if the death rate is the same, there will be more deaths too. Now, let's look at what BBC said. And as much as, so please, folks from UK, don't mind me um, criticizing the news articles. I do the same for the U US as well. I do the same for others too. It seems like um, these news outlets, their basic job is to kind of create some sort of a fear in folks to sell more. So you would see here, keep an eye on the news here that you would see there are lots of statements here that would scare you. And then right next to that statement will be another statement that would neutralize that message. So let's look at it together. So early evidence suggests, so early evidence suggests that the variant of coronavirus that emerged in the UK may be, may be more deadly, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said. Okay, so let's take it on its face value it may be more deadly. Now let's look at the proof for this. Look at the next sentence. However, there remains huge uncertainty. When I reached this far, I actually just wanted to stop reading because that is this is that class, classic uh, bad journalism where they would give you a statement that is horrifying and then they would give you the next statement that is neutralizing this one. And now some of us are going to pick up the horrifying statement and say, look, I am afraid, I'm scared. Look, this is what they wrote. And then some of us are going to pick up the second part of the statement and say, well, it doesn't say that there is a big deal. They don't have the right data yet or, or right assessment or full assessment done. Some of them would combine them and say, well, we need to wait. Some of them are going to say, like me, that, hey, why did you even print these kind of things? But of course, if the prime minister has said, news outlets are going to use that as a story. So here, However, there remains huge uncertainty around the numbers and vaccines are still expected to work. This is very important. Vaccines are still expected to work, <laughs> right? So they, they don't want to scare you so much that you say, fine, you know what? I'm not even going to take the vaccine. This thing is out of control. So vac vaccines are still expected to work, but hey, stay afraid. So now let's look at some more data down here. UK R number, <coughs> excuse me, between 0 0.8 and 1. 0 0.8 and 1 is actually the indication of a stable disease. So now if people did the social distancing, mask wearing, they can actually stop this disease. Look at this. Their evidence has been assessed. So the new data, the evidence has been assessed. And then let's look at the result of the assessment. The group concluded there was a realistic possibility, and that is in air quote, in quotes, that the virus has become more deadly, but this is far from certain. Can you imagine the two sentences? Virus has become more deadly. So if you read just that much, you say, all right, fine, this guy has fallen. And then the next part is, but this is far from certain. So then Sir Patrick Wellens, the government's chief scientist advisor, described the data so far as not yet strong. 
He said, I want to stress that there is a lot of uncertainty around these numbers and we need more work to get a precise handle on it. So guys, get your precise handle. This has been happening since December and then come back with the precise handle instead of these kind of rumors, which people are going to take one part of the sentence or the other. And now the whole society is going to become worried. And not only society, as you can say here, we are sitting in the US and talking about it. Then he says, but it is obviously is a concern that there has an increase in mortality as well as an increase in transmissibility. So we knew that there is an increase in transmissibility. Let's look at the data about the mortality that is shown in the article. I still have to look at the actual data, raw data, to see what is going on. So see here. Previous work suggests that the new variant spreads between 30 and 70 percent faster. Fine, we know that it can spread faster. And there are hints. There is no proof. There are hints. It is about 30% more deadly. Hints of 30% more deadly. So let's look at this. For example, with 1,000 60 year old in, years old infected with the old variant, 10 of them might be expected to die. But this rises to about 13 with the new variant. So they've made a statement here, right? With some data. Look at the next. This difference is found when looking at everyone testing positive for COVID. So everyone who's testing positive, you look at their data, and this is what they think they found. But analyzing only hospital data, where the de deaths are occurring, has found no increase in the death rate. Hospital care has improved. Now, they're saying, please stay scared. And uh, we are going to explain why not increase death rate in the hospitals. Not because the virus may not be more deadly, but hospital care has improved over the course of the pandemic as doctors get better at treating the disease. So my takeaway, and then they assert once again that the vaccines are going to work. So my takeaway from this is that I don't think that this is something that should concern us at this time. I felt the same way when the, yes, there is a concern that the spread is faster. Understood. And you, you can see that here as well. Here, um, spread is faster. And again, this is not known that the spread is faster because it is the virus that is more contagious or is it the events, the Christmas and New Year, or is it both or something else? And then to me, it seems like number of deaths are actually correlating to the increased number of cases. I need to look at the data. So my takeaway was I'm not going to get um, scared of this because every statement and paragraph has been neutralized by the next part of the statement or the paragraph, I am either going to look at the data or I'm going to wait more. So this is how I looked at it. And it actually makes me a little bit of uh, become a little cynical when I see the Pfizer and Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are both expected to work against the variant that emerged in the UK. So please, please, please don't take our message of scaring you as vaccine is not going to work because we want you to take the vaccine at least. So <clears throat> here we are with this one. Not convinced, not super excited about the way they wrote it. OK. So Laura says, um, I have the vaccination on January 9th and tested positive in Jan 18. Thank God I'm doing well. So Laura, we know that the vaccine, uh, number one, yes, thank God you're doing good. Um, now, actually, you would have uh, you would not even need the second dose and you'll you'll be fully protected uh, once you recover from this. But yes, the 9th and 18th is only nine days and the vaccine needs more time to become fully protective. <clears throat> um, Hoplite, Hoplite 76 says, I never quote any statistics unless I fake them myself. <laughs> okay, fine. I need to look at the data before I can um, talk about it. Um, now, 
Kathleen, you noticed this is BBC. This is BBC. This is an article written in BBC. And they're quoting the prime minister and they're quoting the chief of uh, their scientific advisor and all. But for every statement, there is a neutralizing part. And so really from a common public point of view, they scared us. But if we go and tell them that you scared us, they would simply say, did you not read the next part? We were just providing you whatever earlier information we have. And that is my disclaimer as well, that this, this is an evolution of the whole thing. So whatever I am presenting is what I know so far. But I hope that I am doing a little better job than what they are doing. OK, so let's continue. So Liz says, hey, doctor, hi, doctor, if you had a chance to take the Moderna vaccine or Pfizer vaccine, which one will you take? Um, I have uh, said it before as well. I would like to take Moderna more than the Pfizer, but their technologies are the same. Um, Dave says, BBC is not worth anything these days, shame. Yes. So let's continue. I want to take care of some of the uh, Twitter <laughs> questions as well before I am chalaned by the Twitter friends. So let's look at it. So now I'm going to go down here to the bottom. That is the earliest question that was asked. So here, this is a question by or a comment by Joe Smith. He's saying, suggestion that camostat mesylate to suppress TMPRSS2 added to hydroxychloroquine would, would greatly enhance effectiveness. So there is this uh, chart over here. If you see here in this graph, the gray ones are hydroxychloroquine alone. And it looks like hydroxychloroquine is picking up again. And then the, um, the blue one is camostat mesylate. And then the, the purple one is hydroxy plus camostat. And if you see hydroxy with camostat together have more effective outcome compared to both of them separately. So that is a, that is a great news. It is good. Um, Fernando Arana, what's the potential for pulmonary eosinophilia following a viral challenge after vaccination? So first of all, eosinophils. Eosinophils are also immune cells, immune system cells. They are eosinophilic in their um, eosinophils. They are kind of reddish in their appearance, and they have little red bodies in them as well. Most of the time, these uh, reddish, purplish things they they will work to kill the worm. So if here there is a worm, so let's say this is a worm and it is all kind of upset that this eosinophil is going to kill it. Eosinophils usually take part in trying to kill the worms. However, if you see here, and I'm going to show some studies here as well related to the discussion that we just saw. Here is a discussion which says that, and I would suspect that this is not accurate for SARS-CoV-2. What they say over here is this. If you take SARS-CoV-1 vaccine, one, not two, when you take SARS-CoV-1 vaccine and then the reinfection occurs after the vaccination, it is possible that the eosinophils become more active in the lung and they start damaging the lung. So this is the basic gist of the study. However, important thing to note is that this behavior of the immune system is triggered by, so if you see here, the SARS-CoV, so one, vaccine all induced antibody and protection against infections with SARS-CoV, however, Challenge of mice given any of the vaccine led to occurrence of T helper type 2 immunopathology 
suggesting hypersensitivity to SARS-CoV-2 components was in induced. And what com components, if you see here, they would talk about aluminum. So here, check this out. Aluminum adjuvant. Now the Moderna and Pfizer do not have aluminum adjuvant. So this, uh, this uh, concern with the vaccine that somehow somebody who is vaccinated might end up with eosinophilia and causing some lung damage is not correct for the cases of Moderna, Pfizer, and these. Uh, I cannot vouch for all 200, 300 vaccines that do they have the aluminum as an adjuvant or not, but Moderna, Pfizer do not have it. And what I did was I have this link in the description as well, where we talk about various adjuvants that are used in the vaccine, including the aluminum salts over here. And the function of the aluminum salts is that when you give a vaccine and that vaccine has some aluminum with it as well, that aluminum causes triggering or, or irritation of the immune system and immune system becomes a little bit more triggered. So not a problem with the Pfizer and Moderna, at least, because they said that our lipid nanoparticle is sufficient to trigger the immune system. We do not want any other adjuvants. So this was a good question. But I think that for SARS-CoV-1 vaccine type, this may be a concern, not for SARS-CoV-2, at least Moderna and Pfizer. Mirror91 says, your opinion on this study, what is used as prophylaxis? So I think I have the study open here. This is the study. Um, and I also want to talk about antibody dependent enhancement. So <clears throat> yesterday there was a question after I talked about the antibody dependent enhancement and I talked about the use of bromhexin. And I had said that we should use ivermectin plus possibly serine protease inhibitors, for example, chemostat mesylate or bromhexin. So there was a comment on the on YouTube that we are still not clear for how does it work. So let me quickly explain that. So here is what happens. We know that on the surface of the cell, we have, let's say, ACE2 receptor, correct? The function of the ACE2 receptor is to allow the spike protein to bind here. That is what we know. However, when the spike protein is here to be bound, before that binding, we know that we have this uh, chemostat, uh, sorry, TMPRSS2 that is going to be, so this is the guy, helper guy. <laughs> I laugh at my own little cartoon. He, he looks funny. So this is the TMPRSS2. TMPRSS2. So this guy primes the spike protein, and then a part of the spike protein will bind with the ACE2, and the other part will bind with our, our membrane more successfully. It kind of uh, cleaves them, separates them, and then it would make it easy for the virus to get into the cell. So things like bromhexin and um, chemostat mesylate, these are called serine proteases, and they kind of inhibit this membrane, uh, this protein. So that is one. Secondly, in the ADE, antigen uh, antibody dependent enhancement, we had seen a mechanism where we said that when the pathogen is present, so let's say this is the pathogen, SARS-CoV-2, when it has all those spike proteins on it and so on, what happens is that it is possible that antibodies that are connected here to SARS-CoV-2, these will connect with the complement C1Q, C1Q. So there is a complement pathway. What is complement? Complement are a number of proteins that help kill the pathogen, and they are part of the immune system. These complement systems, they become active in the presence of the antibodies. Antibodies actually provide space on them to which complement binds and then complement becomes active. So this is the beginning of the activation of the complement. And let's say C1Q, there is a complex of proteins which are called C1 complex. That C1 complex binds with the antibodies 
and that binding, this was, I believe, ADE mechanism number two, that binding causes the C1Q to have the C1S and C1R, C1R, more proteins to become active. When they do become active, so these proteins, so what are we talking about? We are talking about a C1 complex. And in that, there are three proteins we're looking at, C1Q, C1R, C1S. C1Q is the primary platform. And R and S are also serine protease enzymes, just like TMPRSS2. These enzymes will then, when they see this whole complex is in connection with an antibody, these enzymes would become active and they would then cause, for example, C1R activates C1S and then C1S activates the complement number two and four and the re remaining complement pathway starts and the inflammation starts and the, uh, the fight starts. Now, we know that this pathway can also become a, a pathway for ADE. This thing can become a vehicle for the virus to get into our cell. So what they said was, they said, they should be given serine protease inhibitors that will inhibit C1R and S as well. That means this particular pathway will not become active as much as it will if these inhibitors are not given. So that means bromhexin, TMPR, uh, sorry, chemostat mycelate or other such things can not only help reduce the function of TMPRSS2, but they can also help reduce the function of the complement pathway and reduce the chances of ADE. Although this ADE has not been observed in SARS-CoV-2, but this is just to remove that theoretical possibility that this may be happening in SARS-CoV-2 as well. They are saying give serine proteases. Um, so I hope uh, I'm, I'm making sense. So William, thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you for uh, answering my bromhexin uh, ADE question from yesterday. You're very welcome. So it was your comment, I, I remember. So this is how it works. Okay, so going back uh, to the Twitter, and I'll come to the live site for us in a second. This study was on a similar path. So I thought I would, uh, this is the, ADE discussion. Here, if you see the second, this is the first mechanism. Uh, William, this is the second mechanism. Here, complement receptors has a wide distribution. In this type of ADE, C1Q molecule is part of the complex. And I, this is just, I explained it. All right, so this is the, this is how C1 complex works. And now here is the Camostat mesylate itself. So the next Twitter question was about the camostat mesylate. So um, those folks who have been, the cool beans who have been with me for a longer time, you know that we have been talking about camostat mesylate and bromhexin for a long time. So Mirror91 Plus, uh, please uh, check it out. I have actually put the videos in the description that talk about the serine proteases and that talk about bromhexin and camostat mesylate. One more question here, and then I'll come back to the life side. Uh, Joe Smith says, what is your opinion regarding using both prophylaxis protocols, hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and ivermectin together at the same time in order to increase the protection level? Is there any interaction, interference between the two medication? Are there any contraindication for the high risk of or elderly? I have used them both together. So my own history of management has been, I started with hydroxychloroquine and zinc, and then slowly, I, as ivermectin, I kind of saw it to be more effective. I, I mix them together in some patients. And then finally, I tapered down on usage of hydroxy, and I started using uh, ivermectin more. That means it is being used. However, there are no known contraindications other than any, any folks who have liver enzyme issues. They should be careful for these drugs. So that is one. Second, giving them together in healthy individual should be okay. Two, third, we know that hydroxy can actually cause more cardiac issues than it is said that it will not. I can tell you, I, 
I have managed about 150 to 200 patients at least with hydroxy. Then I switched towards ivermectin. And in them, at least one whole family of five people, and then one more case is where they had the cardiac issues and the arrhythmias occurred. In one case, the children and parents were fine, but children developed arrhythmias. So I'm a little bit concerned about hydroxy that it can cause arrhythmia. Ivermectin is not known to do those kind of a thing. So my preference is ivermectin. Now, in terms of contraindication, of course, hydroxy contraindication, uh, cardiac issues, especially the QT interval or arrhythmias, and then bleeding disorders and so on. For the retinal pathy, retinopathies are also very important for her. Hydroxy. Hydroxy has been, at least for my patients, I saw many of them um, complained that I could not read the newspaper anymore or the newspaper looks blurred. I need to go get my eyesight checked. And the problem was hydroxy. So I reduced the dose, I stopped it, and their eyes recovered. So retinopathies are possible with hydroxy as well. Ivermectin doesn't do that. Ivermectin's um, contraindications are people with the compromised blood brain barrier because it can enter the blood brain. Uh, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and go and cause sometimes permanent damage to the brain. Uh, pregnant women, because it can go from them to their child whose bl blood-brain barrier is being made yet, being formed. And children less than two years of age, because their blood-brain barrier and their uh, neuro nervous system is still being formed as well. So uh, children under 15 kilograms of um, weight or two years of age, pregnant women, uh, people with meningitis, lactating uh, women, they should not take ivermectin. There is a question here about the steroids and ivermectin. I'll address that in a, a few minutes. But just in short, I have not seen any re reason that somehow steroids causes the ivermectin to cross the blood-brain barrier. You would actually see that steroids can are given to uh, with ivermectin in certain diseases because steroids are anti-inflammatory and they are necessary to be given with the ivermectin. When ivermectin kills the worms, there can be immune reactions and then steroids are given with it. So I don't see a problem. We'll talk about that. Okay, so here. Um, how is the life, life side doing? Lynn says, thank you for your videos. You are very welcome. There is a question from Mark O'Kane. Do you practice in the US, Dr. Bean? No, I run drbean.com here. So no, I do not practice here. Uh, why would they repeat anything medical from PM Boris? <laughs> TD says, well, they wrote a, see, there is a buzz out here. Now we're all talking about it and we are all going to their site. And so that gets them um, more advertisement revenue. <clears throat> Correct. So uh, any anybody who has cardiac issues, Susan, hydroxy can cause QT prolongation and arrhythmias. So Denise says that if there are liver enzymes that are bad, ivermectin may be contraindicated. I have seen that ivermectin can actually stress the liver enzymes. Remdesivir is the most dangerous for the liver. Uh, ivermectin can, but it is really, one has to first look at how bad is the liver. So <clears throat> questions, questions, questions. Um, so it looks like here is a question. Janet says, a question, who was suggesting to give the TMPR SSR2 receptor blocker like chemostrate or bromhexane? There are many studies that have shown that TMPR SS2 blockers are useful to, uh, of course, blocking the TMPRSS2. And TMPRSS2, in turn, is necessary to prime the spike protein. 
So I have done those studies in the past. So if you look at the videos that I have in the description of today's discussion, these are my videos. And in their description, you would see the studies that I have referred. Uh, Fran says, is it possible that long haulers are going through the humeral arm pathway, but instead of having full blown storm, they're having a long drawn out low grids possible. Uh, so of course there is a, I always start from this, that if you stand outside, forget about what is the mechanism going on inside the body and look at the clinical signs and symptoms, what are you seeing? So if you look at long haulers, just stand outside, do not think what is happening inside and ask them what's going on. And the symptoms are that of the inflammatory system or immune responses. So once we know that there is inflammation and immune response going on, then the second question becomes, why is it happening? So now we know that there is cytokine storm, not storm storm, but there is cytokines being released. Now, these can be being released for two reasons. One is the immune system has forgotten to switch itself off seeing more and more cytokines and we know that that is possible because if i draw it out very quickly over here like boxes let's say this is the innate immune system and this is the adaptive immune system we know that innate immune system triggers the adaptive immune system then once the adaptive immune system is triggered it will then modulate the innate back for example if the t helper one pathway is taken it re it releases um, interferon gamma which amplifies the innate arm. On the other hand, T helper two pathway actually can release interleukin 10, which reduces the innate arms behavior. But these two arms are going to be amplifying each other. And while this whole process is happening, T helper 17 cells, their job is to become active, stand by, wait for a few days, and then suppress the whole thing. Imagine if the T helper 17 cells did not get the message or they did not become effective enough to suppress the whole thing. Or imagine if this runaway train just kept amplifying each other. So then the signs and symptoms of continuous problem will be seen. That is one possibility. The second possibility is that imagine if the virus is just continuously present. It is hiding in some cells, it, like Dr. Bruce Patterson said, maybe in the monocytes. So virus is continuously present, maybe in the low levels, and it is not going away, but it, it continues to trigger the immune system. And that would cause the immune system's response, which would then cause the signs and symptoms that we see. Now, what is the solution for this? A temporary solution. So if we go here, in this case, giving steroids would just switch off the immune system's behavior. And when it reboots, hopefully it would be rebooted correctly. So that is why so far for my patients, their um, long hauling state goes away as soon as the steroid pulses are used. But I am very, very diligent right in the beginning to so aggressively treat the patient that I hope and I wish and I pray that they don't end up in a consistently chronic state. Now here, um, steroids are useful. But if imagine that the virus is sitting out here, and it is continuously poking our immune system and, and triggering it, then we need to do something about the virus itself. That is where things like ivermectin or maybe vaccines might help. And then of course, as the system is triggered, still the steroids and anti-inflammatory things will help. At least they would reduce the symptoms, but we still need to do something about this virus because you'll take something you will take a course of, let's say, ivermectin or steroid, and then you stop it and the symptoms will come back. Why? Because either the immune system was not reset correctly or the virus is just sitting there still. So this is what is happening. So, France, your, um, <clears throat> your thinking is correct, that it is possible that humeral pathway is just continuously being triggered because there is the low grade activity. So that activity is going on. The question is, why is that happening? And for that, how do we turn it off? Eventually, do whatever. There will be two type of solutions. Either give steroids to block the whole system and reset it, or give some antiviral things to remove the virus.
you are very welcome. So Wayne has a question. How come I can eat two inches from someone on the airplane with no mask, but I can't eat in a restaurant eight feet from someone? So that is a problem with the people who are making policies. And I. this is why I don't fly. Meaning there is no science. Of course, I have read some studies which says that the air, the the ventilation system and the HEPA filters and everything in the airplanes is much more effective and better and blah. But still, you're sitting absolutely next to somebody. And well, if you have now gotten the person vaccinated or they have an RT-PCR negative proven, then that's a different thing. Otherwise, yes, the risk is there. Uh, Patricia says, should I stop NAC after getting vaccination dose number two? Also, can I take ibuprofen for symptoms from the vax dose number two? So the any medicine taking should be in consultation with the doctors who are giving the dose so that they are aware that you have taken some medicine and they don't just think that, all right, you're feeling better, all right, you can go home. So, so that they can observe you for the correct time, regardless of you feeling anything or not. So that is with their uh, consultation. Now, for the first part, NAC, you can stop NAC uh, once you feel that you are immunized because NAC's function is to help with the uh, reactive oxygen species and reducing this uh, virus's behavior uh, or side effects. Still, NAC once in a while is actually a good thing to take regardless of the SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> Marek says, if I kiss my horse and get worms, <laughs> would I then qualify to be approved for ivermectin? Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't kiss your horse. <laughs> uh, Janet says, isn't alcoholism a contraindication for ivermectin because of blood-brain barrier concerns, not so much liver enzymes issue for alcohol ivermectin? So if alcohol is going to cause the permeability of blood-brain barrier to increase, which I talked about in one of the previous discussions, then yes, ivermectin can be a problem because then it would cross a blood-brain barrier. So it really depends how much of the um, how much of the toxicity is because of alcohol, how much alcohol is taken. So Henry, this is a very important question. So Henry's question is, I live in India. I'm not sure that government will ever really vaccinate 1.3 billion people, nor do I trust their untested home vaccine. How long, um, how long should I give ivermectin to my family? And I have talked about this, uh, Henry, a few times. Ivermectin in this consistent way or administration in this consistent way has never been tested. Now it is being tested, but ivermectin has only been tested in, let's say, one 150 microgram to 200 microgram per kilogram body weight once in a three month or once in a six months or once in a year. So it has never been tested as giving twice a month or giving thrice a month and so on. The uh, FLCC, I use their name because, number one, they're doing a good job. Number two, there are many doctors, and they are coming together and saying, this is what we think. So there is more verification and support from there. So it's not just me who is talking about it. They, uh, they are prescribing every two weeks. For how long is still a question. And when I work with my patients, so again, this is not a prescription for anyone over here. When I work with my patients, I give them uh, the therapeutic dose every week. But I usually give the lower end of the therapeutic dose, that is 150 microgram per kilogram body weight. So Edmund HR says, is there an update from pregnant ladies to get the vaccine? Is it safe? If no, not how long after the vaccine should someone get pregnant? So the data that is from the trials, that showed that they had excluded pregnant women from getting the vaccine. So that means from a data point of view, pregnant women are not 
tested for it. So they're not given vaccine. Secondly, in both cases, Pfizer and Moderna, they were women who became pregnant after they had taken the first dose. So that means they had taken the first dose. Maybe they were at that time they had conceived, but the test was not positive yet, or they did not know yet. Or maybe after the first dose, they had the intercourse afterwards, and then they became pregnant. But then once they were known to be pregnant before the second dose, then the second dose was not given. And the trials said, the documents said, we are now going to wait till the end of pregnancies to see if the dose had done anything. So this is the data so far. That means don't know. TD, you are correct that NIH is now not pro or against. They used to be against ivermectin. Now they don't care for the, or they have taken the against part, but they're also not for, which in my opinion is a, incorrect position that they should look at the data and say that, yeah, we are pro ivermectin, but they said that data is not good quality data, which I think if you can come back and say BAM Lanivimab is good and Remdesivir is good, look at that data. That's not great data. Um, So Ruby Zaret says, AstraZeneca measured interferon gamma demonstrating T helper 1 activity, but focus on T helper 2 antibodies in their report. Jensen is T helper 1 skewed. These are best vaccines to take then. <clears throat> so just so that we can have the rest of our cool beans follow along as well. So here is the innate arm. And here is the naive T cell. And then this is the T helper 2 pathway, which then goes to plasma. So from B cell to plasma cell, and that is the antibody or humoral pathway. And here is a T helper 1 pathway, which goes to cytotoxic T cell pathway, which is cytotoxic pathway. So the interesting thing is this, that even when these companies know that we are able to go this way faster and better, they still report the, the antibody production because that is the only thing they can report. If they came back and they said, we had given a vaccine and there were no antibodies, and we are very, very happy that there were lots of cytotoxic T cell, they are not going to be approved. So it is kind of their uh, need to talk about antibodies. Now to answer your question, Ruby Zared, that which vaccine is better? If I think about it, for me, the best vaccine, again, we don't have data yet, but from a technical point of view and from a mechanistic point of view, I like Novavax. The reason for that is very simple. Novavax does not bring in any RNA. It doesn't bring in any adenovirus. It actually brings in an aggregate of spike proteins and just directly injects it into the muscle over there, the immune system cell directly work with the spike protein itself. So they don't need to give messenger RNA to make spike proteins, or they're not giving any adenovirus to bring in the spike protein RNA, nothing like that. They're just giving spike proteins. And then those spike proteins are being used to trigger the immune system. So from a uh, conceptual point of view, I love it. The How would it work? We do not have the data yet. Now, in the absence of that data, then if we look at Moderna's or Pfizer's or AstraZeneca and others, the basic difference is Moderna, Pfizer, messenger RNA, AstraZeneca, adenovirus, and many other like that. The um, All vaccines are measured as the ones triggering antibodies or not. However, I prefer vaccines that have better skewing towards T helper 1 pathways because that pathway actually handles the virus better, at least in the studies that I have discussed, and causes less, less symptoms. So that is my um, opinion from the studies I have seen.
So, so AS says, what about the Moderna Vax makes you more comfortable uh, versus the Pfizer? So both Pfizer and Moderna, I'm kind of comfortable with both of them. Um, I was less comfortable with Pfizer in the beginning because they had more severe allergic reactions than Moderna. But now Moderna has allergic reactions as well. Moderna has polyglyc um, polyethylene glycols as well. So they are kind of same. Pfizer's only problem now is logistics compared to Moderna. Moderna can be rolled out, for example, in the US to 60, 600 sites. Pfizer cannot be rolled out to all of them because of the cold storage need. And it can be spoiled easily. So because of those things, I'm kind of a little hesitant about are about Pfizer, but their mechanisms are the same. Then uh, what about those over 75 years? So basically, when we are slightly in the advanced age, the more important thing is not the age, but any comorbidities. So those comorbidities have to be seen to understand which vaccine may be better. So far, they have tested them on all ages, Moderna, Pfizer, and they work fine. Uh, of course, you have now seen that in Norway, uh, Pfizer's vaccine has caused, now I'm, I'm making air quotes over here, they have caused uh, deaths. And the reason I make the quotes over here because they don't agree that they caused the deaths. Although at the end of the day, it was the vaccine that triggered the symptoms and the um, reaction in the body, may that be diarrhea, nausea, and other, and the patient was too frail to handle that situation and they died. So then there is a guidance given to say, don't give vaccines to someone who is too frail. So um, there are issues with the vi vaccine at advanced ages. So it depends how is the person's state. That state can be seen by the doctor and then decided uh, these vaccines are similar. Uh, so Sher says, I'm frustrated with Moderna's recall of a lo lot in California. How did that happen? Not so good. Correct. So there has been, a, I think, 330,000 doses that were causing a lot of uh, immune reactions or allergic reactions, and they stopped them. Uh, so yes, there is a problem. So meaning, when you hear me more biased towards Moderna, it is really the same because they are once they are coming out in production, they are getting all kinds of issues as well. So Terry says, note, Moderna had the cold storage issue, but figured it out. And yes, they asked them that, how did you figure it out? And they said, it's our proprietary information. So how did they do it? Did they add something like polyethylene glycol a little more? They did something. And... Uh, less probability for transmission, less probability for transmission should not be a Moderna's uh, flagship behavior and Pfizer's, for example, cannot. Because at the end of the day, both are producing uh, spike proteins. So when they're both producing spike proteins, that means they both are going to cause the immune system to behave in a similar way. The difference can be that, for example, let's say here is a spike protein. Let's say this is a spike protein. And there is the receptor binding domain over here. It is possible that Moderna is using this much part of the spike protein to make the spike. And they are just ignoring this part of the spike protein. And it is possible that Pfizer, for example, is using this much part of the spike protein structure and ignoring the other part. Or maybe let's say this part and ignoring the other part. And based on that, it is possible that how much triggering of the immune system they do. The transmissibility is actually depending up, dependent upon the IgA production. So what happens is in our mouth and nose, what will happen is, let's say this is the fluids in our mouth. I'm just going to use mouth as an example. So let's say this is the fluid layer in the mouth. And then behind that layer are cells. So here are cells. Whichever vaccine it is, Moderna or Pfizer, once it has caused the immune system cells to become triggered and B cells to become triggered. So imagine that here is a B cell 
that became a plasma cell. Plasma cell will mean it is a cell that would make antibodies. In the beginning, the B cell will make IgD and IgM, correct? Then some of these B cells will further mature or class switch and they would start making IgG. Now, some of them will become memory cells as well, and they can make IgGs in future. Then some of these cells are going to class switch further to make IgE and then IgA, continuously class switching. And this IgA and E formation is dependent upon interleukin secretions. And that secretion, interleukin 4, would happen in both cases. So that means IgA production will be there for both cases. And the result of that IgA production will be that IgA will be sitting in our immune system, or sorry, in our mucous membranes. And so when the virus would arrive in our mouth, these IgAs are supposed to stick to that virus right in the mucous system and just trap it. And now when that virus is projected back out, it would be coated with the IgA. That is one. Secondly, it is possible that there are other immune system cells sitting here, like cytotoxic T cells and um, um, the NK cells or the uh, macrophages, trained immunity may be there, plus adaptive immunity may be there. And so as soon as the virus arrives, they attack this area and just take care of the virus. This behavior has to be the same for both vaccines or other vaccines too. So I don't think that we can claim that any one vaccine will be superior to curtail the transmissibility compared to other. Or, or, or be less transmissible or not. Dr. Sarita says, Dr. Bean, impressive explanation. Thank you. Um, continuing. How is everyone doing? We become so busy in uh, <laughs> in these discussions that we the heart the heart to heart part sometimes get missed. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Lynn, messenger RNA vaccine has been tried for cancers and other. These were actually started. Moderna's basic researches were started for cancer, and I think the advancement and the money that they're getting now, they are going to start. Uh, producing things that would help with cancers. So how about if I answer some of the questions on the Twitter side as well? OK, there is one more question here, then I'll go to Twitter. Uh, Bob Sipola. Question, Dr. Bean, have you seen the recent study regarding decreased antibody efficacy from donor convalescent plasma versus the South African variant thoughts? I haven't seen the study. So what I cannot say is that is it the convalescent? You know that convalescent plasma is not always effective. This was already not very effective. Otherwise, we would have stopped everything and just convalescent plasma. People would have lined up and convalescent plasma is the one that, that would have been used. Somehow, convalescent plasma did not work that well. And that, there are many reasons for that. For example, the antibodies that I generated may not be very good for the antibodies um, when given to another person. Secondly, it is possible that my antibodies decayed very fast. And by the time it is being given, my antibodies are actually less useful. Thirdly, it is possible that the patient who is receiving the convalescent plasma has already moved from the viral stage to the cytokine storm stage. And now you give whatever convalescent plasma, it's not going to help. So there are many reasons for convalescent plasma not to work. So we got to look at that study. So Bob, if you can give me the link to it, I can look into that. That is it the escape of the virus from the antibodies? If that is the case, then we should be concerned. If it is not the escape and something else, then we should not be concerned. <laughs> Janet says, oh, Dr. Bean, oh, I have issues. Janet, tell me, uh, is there something that I can uh, respond for you?
Uh, Rifat says, Dr. Bean, can you put some light on Indian vaccines? My problem is this. Let, let me do this. This is the same for Sputnik as well. Somebody uh, wrote a comment criticizing me that I somehow am avoiding Sputnik because I am uh, somehow not sold in this. Look, Indian uh, COVID vaccine trial data. So scientists criticize rushed approval. This is January 5. So if you see here, India's drug regulator approved two COVID-19 vaccines on 3rd January, but the data from SI studies have yet to be analyzed fully. It is possible that they look at interim data and say we're good, but even that interim data has to be very strong. So my problem so far is that I'm not seeing Maybe I'm spoiled. I am more used to looking at the data like Moderna's data or Pfizer's data or AstraZeneca's data. So the data that has a lots of variables addressed in there. Uh, I'm not seeing those. So maybe it is just my, uh, my problem. Uh, if I go back here and say Sputnik vaccine trial data. So here, November 24, second in-term analysis of clinical trial data showed a 91.4% efficacy. But when I actually go to look at the data, like I have gone through the documents for Moderna and Pfizer, I don't see that. And so I do not know how to respond. So what I'll do is this. I would once again go and try to find the uh, PDF. And if you know where these are, it would help me respond. So refer to your question, I need to see the data to be able to make better mind because as you as you can see from journalists or from the um, companies themselves, we get all kinds of uh, look at this. Look how BBC is reporting. We are all afraid and, and scared at what has happened. So hopefully that um, answers that question. So let's do this. I promise that I would look for more data on Sputnik and India's vaccines. And if somebody has the data, please give it to me and we'll talk about it. OK, so. Let's, M. St. Clair, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, Mr. J says, don't we have enough data now to confirm reinfection? We have enough data that we see reinfection, but think about it. We have tens of millions of cases and a fewer, compared to them, a fewer reinfection cases. That number of reinfections are not sufficient enough to say we should be very, very scared. You are very welcome. So let's go to Twitter for a second as well. So in Twitter, next one is, so we talked about this. Stephen Westman says, had anyone alerted the loudest ivermectin advocates? Had anyone alerted the loudest ivermectin advocates in USA, Canada, that their communication style has harmed rather promoted the cause of wider spread? use of ivermectin. The last Senate hearing was troubling as some witness were embarrassingly unprofessional in their approach. So Stephen, uh, I have only heard about Dr. Corey and I actually am very happy that Dr. Paul Marek and Corey, they raised their voices enough that uh, NIH heard them, WHO heard them, WHO actually said that we are okay with ivermectin, NIH said, took their against uh, stand to not against and not for stand. So I think they are working, but maybe there is some other uh, hearings that I am not aware of. I usually try to stay focused on the actual concepts and try to cut away the noise, noise part. So I may have missed it. 
RB long hauler. Hello, Dr. Bean. Your thoughts on Celebrex to battle inflammation as COX-2 inhibitor. I am having success with it. So he's a, I'm, I'm suspecting that you're saying I'm a long hauler. And when I take Celebrex, it, it helps me. Did you see the interview on Dr. Drew regarding the efficacy of fluvoxamine as a sigma-1 agonist to control the cytokine storm? So I did not see it, but I have been chatting with Dr. Drew about the fluvoxamine. So let me show a couple of things here. Number one, um, this is the fluvoxamine. I am going to do a complete separate talk about fluvoxamine. And this is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. This is a drug that is used for some psychological issues. And it seems to have been helpful for uh, COVID as well. So I'll do a complete talk about it. The second part, the Celebrex. So Celecoxib is the brand name. Celebrex is a COX-2 inhibitor. So I have actually done, if you look for aspirin, in COVID-19 videos, I have done a discussion about how COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors help with the COVID from spreading too much. So it is a similar behavior. So yes, there is a benefit to it, but not for everyone. Those folks who are at the risk of cytokine storm or hypercoagulable states, they would have a benefit from it. Now, in your case, if you're a long hauler, COX-2 inhibitors are anti-inflammatory. So see once again that the if you stand outside of the patient's um, whole system and just think about the signs and symptoms, clinical signs and symptoms, you know that there is inflammation going on. And so if there is inflammation going on, then anti-inflammatory drugs would help. The problem is that will the symptoms come back when the drug is stopped? If that is the case, that means the underlying abnormality is not gone we had just kind of masked the masked the uh, the symptoms of it so what i would like to actually understand is uh, rb that when you take this do you become okay and then when you stop this does it does do the symptoms return Douglas says, my wife is concerned that if she receives the vaccine and then gets pregnant, then that there is a great chance of effects like autism that could develop in the child years down the road. How likely are side effects in growing children if parents get vaccine before conception? So uh, I answered this question in a different uh, context a little bit before as well. There is no data yet for the uh, pregnancy and then the children an effect on them afterwards. They had actually, for all the vaccines so far that I'm seeing, they had excluded those who were pregnant. And if they became pregnant after the first dose, they excluded those as well. Now, what will happen if somebody has taken the first dose and then the second dose and then two, three months later they became pregnant? I think I'm giving my opinion and I may be wrong. My opinion is nothing bad will happen to the child. So that is what my opinion is because number one, there are no adjuvants. Number two, there are no long standing um, issues in terms of any cytokine storms. What the mother has developed is a um, possibility to develop immunoglobulin G when she is infected with the virus. And they have already seen this with pregnant women who became infected as well, regardless of the vaccine. So let's say I am a pregnant woman, woman and I became infected. So they have seen that the woman actually passes in immunoglobulin G for SARS-CoV-2 to the child through the placenta, protecting the child. And then they also see that there is IgA that is released in the breast milk as well that protects too. So there is a protective effect from the immunoglobulins. And that is not just true for SARS-CoV-2 as well. Mother passes IgGs that are in her body to her child through placenta when her child is in, in her, in all cases. And that gives the child immunity for a few weeks to months after the birth. And that is a critical part of child's protection because those children that are born without these protections given by mother, they are not able to create their own antibodies very quickly because their system is not fully ready yet. And they keep getting infections again and again and again. So from a mechanistic point of view, there is no harm. It is actually protective. Uh, Fernando Arana says, question two. 
ivermectin steroids and the blood brain barrier i believe that dexamethasone and methylprednisolone can make the blood brain barrier leaky if a patient was already on steroids what time duration of steroids if any recommended before ivermectin is used <clears throat> so first important thing if you are on steroids, do not stop steroids because stopping steroids abruptly can cause severe damage. And depending upon the dose, in some cases, dose and type of the uh, steroid, in some cases, can cause the suprarenal glands to burst, and that can even lead to death. So don't don't modulate your steroid uh, drugs that you're taking without your doctor's advice and their help for tapering. That's one. Second. There are a few studies I have over here. This is one, prednisolone's effect or prednisone's effect on blood-brain barrier permeability and CNS IgG synthesis in healthy immune, uh, healthy patients. So here in this one, we found only a non-significant decrease in BBB permeability. So not much. There is nothing. Then if you look at this one, steroids and the blood-brain barrier therapeutic implications and once again, over here, they're saying the blood-brain barrier at the level of the brain microvascular endothelium serves as the principal interface between the peripheral circulation and the, uh, uh, and the brain. Steroids have been identified to impact several critical properties of the blood-brain barrier, including cellular efflux mechanism. Efflux mechanism means something coming out of the cell, uh, nutrient uptake and tight junction integrity. Such actions not only influence brain hemostasis, but also the delivery of CNS targeted therapeutics. But if you continue there, they say a greater understanding is needed. So again, there is nothing significant they have found. There is a uh, possibility. And then finally, I want to show you there is a Mayo Clinic's um, data here, which I had it open. Just one second. Here, check this one out. You would like this. So this is myoclinic.org. Your doctor, so th this is they're talking about the deworming, not SARS-CoV-2. Your doctor may also prescribe a corticosteroid for certain patients with river blindness, especially those with severe symptoms. This is to help reduce the inflammation caused by the death of the worms. If your doctor prescribed these two medicines together, that is ivermectin and steroid. It is important to take the corticosteroid along with ivermectin. So if there was so much of an issue with the ivermectin and steroid, these kind of things would not happen. And now think about it for a second. What happens is when we give deworming medicines like ivermectin, they go in and they destroy the worm. Now, worms are not tiny, small viruses or bacteria. They are big things. They are like this big or even longer. So when they are destroyed, their broken pieces are present everywhere and they trigger the immune system like hell. And that itself can cause severe allergic reactions and anaphylaxis because of worms antibodies. And so what they do is they, they give steroid with ivermectin so that this kind of a thing would not happen. So now imagine if this was steroid usage was so much of a problem that this kind of a thing would not happen. So I don't feel that there is an issue. But of course, somebody on steroid is very important to talk with your doctor and figure it out together. OK, one more here, and then I'll come back to the live site. So this is a good one. Matt says, more good news can be. So if you see here, here is the good news. And I love this one. So one more tiny, what time is it? 7.14, so we're OK. Um, a tiny concept that I want to add here. I hope you are up for it. Uh, it is going to be a little bit interesting, but a little deeper. So let's look at it. Ready? Here. Luffy. Luffy. Come from the other door. <laughs> I have closed this door, and he wants to come in from here. OK, so. Um, we were talking about the, uh, yes, so the three chymotrypsin-like protease. Somebody had left a comment that somehow my cat is hungry, and that is why they do it. I have those auto-feeding uh, little things. So they are always fill, 
filled and cats can just go there and eat and when they eat a little bit they get more food so it's not about food or water it's just luffy is like this he just talks too much okay so um talking about the one more interesting role of fiber magnet this is beautiful so matt thank you very much for sharing it so look what happens this is in praise of ivermectin. This is a new mechanism. I did not know this one. So here, let's say this is our cell. And ivermectin arrives in to our cell. Correct? So this is ivermectin man. The hero. Now what happens is we know its function with the viral cargo. I'm going to talk about a different function. Now imagine here is the SARS-CoV-2. This SARS-CoV-2 entered our cell as well. And here is the SARS-CoV-2's messenger RNA. We know that when the, and I have done this discussion early on, that how does the SARS-CoV-2 replication occurs? So messenger RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 is in our nucleus now, oh, sorry, cell now, cytoplasm. This RNA is then polymerized it, or it is uh, translated by our ribosomes into a protein which is called a polyprotein and i had given the example of toys the children's toys which have for example let's say animal models in them so there is a big sheet and in the sheet there are tiny cutouts of various animals and you can just take them out by uh, pushing them this is the same thing when the first viral protein is formed from its RNA, it is a polyprotein, meaning it has tiny enzymes that are stuck in it and that need to be removed from it. Now, to when they are removed, they will become active enzymes and they will work, but so far they are stuck in this sheet of big protein. There are a couple of pieces of this big protein which automatically separate from it. So imagine this black part. Once they separate from it, from the protein, big protein, then they go and work on this protein and separate the other proteins from it. Now these guys, these black ones, that can come out of it by themselves. These are called three chymotrypsin-like proteases. So look at the name. Three is just a number because of the structure. Chymotrypsin is a uh, protein that, that breaks down chyme or trypsin. Three chymotrypsin like protease. Protease means uh, protein breaking enzyme. What this means is that simply this black enzyme over here is called is three chymotrypsin like. So there is another enzyme in us which is called chymotrypsin. So chymotrypsin like protease. Are you with me on this one? This is actually a beautiful mechanism. Are you with me? So this is the black enzyme of the virus itself. And it is a protease. That means it breaks down the proteins. So what it would do is it will then break down this protein of the virus and liberate from it these tiny proteins that are stuck in this thing. These tiny proteins would come out and they are enzymes. And then they would further help the virus um, uh, replication and virus assemblies. Now, ivermectin. I did not know this. I just read it from that uh, link that Matt sent. Ivermectin can block this. And interestingly, this three chymotrypsin like protease is also a serine protease, just like TMPRSS2. That means Bromhexin and camostat mesylate can also inhibit this. And ivermectin inhibits this as well. This is, for, so for the longest time I had said, ivermectin is not an antiviral. However, if this is a mechanism that actually does happen, then ivermectin is an antiviral as well because it is going to block the virus's enzyme which takes part, that virus's enzyme takes part in helping replicate the virus. So now it is an antiviral that it does not kill the virus, but it does not let make more viruses. So this would be called a virostatic drug. 
virostatic means whatever viruses are there, their new viruses cannot be formed. Viricidal drug will mean something that can kill existing viruses. So this is a possibly virostatic drug. So let me show you this study here. So this is the this is the protein in the SARS-CoV-2. And then here, if you read here, ivermectin is known to be, so this, there's a lot of data here, but interestingly, one of the ivermectin was able to inhibit more than 85%, almost completely, of 3CL proactivity in our in vitro enzymatic study. So they did outside the body. And then they refer back to Australian study and said, we saw the same behavior of ivermectin and this um, reducing the viral load is not just by the viral cargo thing that we've talked about. It is actually directly ivermectin working on the viral enzymes to block them from working further and making helping make more viruses. That is this here. Again, the, uh, the links are in the description. So this is a beautiful mechanism. If this is true, this is in vitro, and this is an observation. If this is true, then we'll say ivermectin is a virostatic or virostatic drug as well. So Matt, thank you very much for this. You are correct. This is a great news. Uh, I love it. OK, so coming here to the <laughs> live side. How are things here? So I just saw RB. So RB long hauler, Dr. Bean, you're absolutely right. The inflammation relief of the cerebral cerebrex is temporary. Hey, Luffy, come here. Come. What are you doing? The thing is this, if I try to hold him, he runs away. Luffy. So, um, RB, I'm sorry that this is the situation. We still need to figure out, um, is it the immune system that is not switched off correctly, or is it the, um, is it the virus sitting somewhere? And my apologies, now both Kyrie and Luffy are here, and now they're playing. So they, you would hear some noises. Nipa Gandhi says, question, having ivermectin 12 milligram every 15 days, is it okay to wait for the vaccine? Would you prefer Johnson & Johnson? Um, so number one, if you're taking ivermectin, you're lucky that you have the ivermectin. It is good to have. Um, are you saying that is it okay to wait to have the vaccine, meaning don't take the vaccine right away? I would take the vaccine right away. That is just my personal opinion. So I cannot influence anyone with this because it's going to be your decision. I would be, as soon as I'm given the uh, the vaccine, I'll take it. Now, would you prefer Johnson & Johnson, T Helper 1? Johnson & Johnson is great. Novavax is great. I would take them. Johnson & Johnson is still in phase three. Novavax is also still in phase three. So we don't have the approval yet, but they are good vaccines. So Ridge says, can doctors now prescribe ivermectin? Yes, so now they can prescribe ivermectin for SARS-CoV-2 because NIH is not against it. Previously, if they were doing it for SARS-CoV-2, NIH was against it, so pharmacies were declining it, or they could go to the doctor and say, why the heck did you do it? So at least from NIH's point of view, they are not going to stop the doctor. The second part now is to actually convince the doctor to do it because they themselves seem to have not the full grasp of the importance of ivermectin. Sure, you are very correct, Luffy. Luffy always wants to come in at the right critical time and add his two cents. Laura says, I love all the drama that I, absolutely every cell is a universe. <laughs> yes, Lu Luffy is that way. Um, So there's a question, uh, Joshua Johnson says, why are all the vaccines makers use only the spike protein and not other parts of the virus? Wouldn't that make it stronger against mutations? Good question. The 
if we give, there are vaccines that are going to use inactivated virus, which will then allow the vaccines to be made, uh, antibodies to be made for the other parts as well. Problem is we do not want too many antibodies that are just binding antibodies, meaning when the virus comes in, they just bind to it and they don't neutralize it. That can cause overactive immune system that may cause ADE and making air quotes because it's not proven. So targeting the spike protein is the best way because you directly attack that part of the, vex, uh, the virus that is going to uh, be the most important part of the virus for binding. So um, against the mutations, that is correct. So I would kind of say it this way, that can they have more than one pro, uh, antibodies? And yes, when you produce spike protein, there are hundreds of antibodies that are produced. So it is very difficult for virus to mutate away from all of them. So I don't ex expect the virus to mutate away. Luffy. Okay, so, so there is a question from Jen. Can you compare flu shot to COVID shot? Let's take that for a different time because there are lots of things to compare. Um, so the rubies are red is saying, question, could long hauling be the result of germinal center damage, which leads to a variety of immune systems? So let me just very quickly explain what the question is. So what happens is we have, this is, let's say this is a lymph node. In the lymph node, there are, there are fluids, lymph fluid that is flowing in. And in this lymph fluid, the macrophages and dendritic cells and just fluids are coming in and they are bringing in antigens. In here, there are B cells sitting and there are T cells sitting and they are going to be the adaptive arm. And there are follicular dendritic cells sitting and there are some other cells here as well, follicular dendritic cells. So these cells would then become ramped up for the adaptive arm. They would make copies of themselves and they'll work. So Rubies is saying that, is there a possible, so these things can be called germinal centers. So do we have a germinal center damage? I do not know. Germinal center damage would occur if the inflammation within the lymph node is such that the lymph node tissue itself is attacked and that causes local inflammation that then causes calcification and destruction of the lymph node, which happens in many cases, people get uh, calcified lymph nodes. I do not know if the SARS-CoV-2 causes calcified lymph nodes. So good question. I think it is yet to be seen that if this happens or not. Okay, so uh, I have not seen um, Jim Mattox for some days. Anybody knows how is he doing? Um, so Rifa says, is there any uh, study previously on infected people who got re-exposed to the virus and then they change in antibody titer? Other words, body response to reinfection? No. Uh, and the reason is, number one, if somebody does become reinfected, they do not go and get them themselves tested. And we, on ethical and moral basis, we cannot reinfect a person to then see what is the response. This has been seen in chimpanzees and over there, as soon as the reinfection occurs, the body starts making the B cells that were sleeping and were memory B cells, they start making antibodies and kind of take care of the uh, situation. Rubies are red, uh, super sticker, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Francis, we oui, Ruby, yeah, thank you. Um, so let's look at so gold country. Russ says, please share more insights on how often we need 
ivermectin for effective prophylaxis flcc says 14 days and you have mentioned seven days that is a really big difference okay so let's start from the study the original study that showed prophylaxis worked came out of malaysia and they had done day one and day three if i'm recalling correctly of full dose ivermectin for one complete month so twice one and three or i think one or five and then stopped and then repeated and then repeated once in a month this was their study the flcc's i think uh, position is somewhere between mine and that study dr marik had actually at one point when i did this uh, video that ivermectin works Dr. Marek started looking into ivermectin after that, and he reached out to me and he said, can I use one of the slides from your video? Because he had become very interested in ivermectin as well. So just one second, I'm going to have uh, uh, Luffy with me. So one quick second. Okay, he ran away. <laughs> we tried. He ran away. Okay, so where were we? Um, yeah, so the ivermectin history. So then um, I started giving ivermectin to my patients on a weekly basis. What I did was those who were sick, who had become COVID-19 positive, I started giving them ivermectin on a daily basis until their oxygen saturations recovered and until their clinical signs and symptoms became better. Now, I did not know exactly if it was harmful or if it was not to be given because ivermectin was never used in that way. But the studies that I had done was I looked at the ivermectin's uh, distribution. I looked at its half-life. And then I looked at its uh, interaction with other drugs, its effect on liver and kind of did my homework to see that, all right, if I give it in this dose, it should be OK. And it never I saw any problems. From there, I was encouraged enough to continue for prophylaxis to give ivermectin full dose once a week. Now, FLCC stands between the two of us, the Malaysian study, which says twice in one month. Now, biweekly is almost twice as well. But the concentrations are different because the ivermectin's half-life is 18 hours. So that means after 18 hours, it starts dropping and becoming half every 18 hours. So if you give it from day one to day 15, there are many 18 hours that have occurred and its concentration is going down. So it may be actually there is no overlap between them. Malaysian study did day one and three and so there was still ivermectin higher uh, concentration present when the new dose was given. I did something else, <coughs> excuse me, and that was before the dose went down too much, I started another dose. And then before that went down too much, I gave another dose. So uh, to answer your question, really nobody knows what is the right one. If you look at the data from study, then one, one day and then third day, and that's it for a month, and then repeat the same thing. That is studied, and that has shown effect. My thing has shown effect for me, but it's not a study. FLCCs is possibly showing effect to them as well, but it is not studied. Uh, Shayur says, any update on the Novavax? So I have done a complete discussion about Novavax and their mechanism of action. Uh, they are still in the uh, phase three trial. So once we have more data, we'll talk about it. <laughs> France says, Dr. Bean really is a modern day Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, France. I'm sad that Luffy ran away when I was trying to bring him to the screen.
he's back here but you think i should try to hey luffy no he knows that he is important at this time okay so <clears throat> Simple Garden says, long haul symptoms was swollen lymph nodes. Ivermectin fixed that, no more swelling. Would Ivermectin cure the possible adaptive arm damage? So the let's look at it together. I'm going to share my screen. So, the, so let's say swollen lymph nodes. Why do lymph nodes swell, actually? The lymph nodes swell because this lymph node over here they have a tight mesh on them. Their, their surface is very tight. It's not flexible. So they cannot expand easily. And now what happens is inside them, the B cells and the T cells, when they become triggered by some antigen, they start becoming proliferated. That means they increase in number. Now, many of these B and T cells would get out of the lymph node and go out and live somewhere else and function somewhere else. So that is fine. That is the exit route. But a lot of them are just going to continue to sit here. And because of that, the lymph node size would increase because the number of cells have increased inside. And when they kind of uh, you know, uh, expand and push the walls of the lymph node, that causes this uh, the pain. And that is why if you kind of massage them, they, these cells would slowly get out of them and you'll feel better. Now, um, you, you're saying that the lymph nodes were swollen, then you took ivermectin. Ivermectin, one role of ivermectin is to reduce the inflammation. And one part of the inflammation, whenever you have swelling somewhere and pain, that is inflammation. So, of course, ivermectin helps with this. Secondly, ivermectin is also helping by reducing the viral control. Thirdly, now that this new mechanism is there, if it is correct, then it is actually reducing the viral load as, as well through directly virostatic behavior. All of that would reduce the load on the lymph node and lymph node would feel better. Now, would ivermectin cure the possible adaptive arm damage? The question now is, is the adaptive arm actually damaged? So it, the runaway immune system is not an adaptive arm damage. The runaway immune system is a, so here, let's say this is the innate arm. What are the cells in the innate arm? Natural killer cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and so on. Majority are these cells. And then the adaptive arm has two parts in it, and that is the T helper 2 side or the humeral and T helper 1 side or the cytotoxic. It is the, the problem is that there is a third and actually a fourth one as well, but let's just use a third one, and that is T helper 17. T helper 17's function is to be an observer and then calm down this system. The amplification of the immune system is bilateral. That is, innate arm triggers the adaptive arm. Adaptive arm, once it becomes triggers, triggered, will then amplify the innate arm. And then they, both systems are just going to keep winding up each other and they both would keep amplifying each other's behavior until the T helper 17 cells would step in and say, guys, stop it. Don't get further excited. And that is how the immune system would start calming down. It is really this T helper 17 system that probably is not working correctly if it is runaway immune system. That is one part. On the innate side, on this side, it is the macrophages that have become run runaway. So now macrophages on, on this side, on the innate si side are runaway and they are causing macrophage activation syndrome. On this side, the T helper 17 are not working correctly. So both arms are malfunctioning. Can we take them both and bring them down? Yes, with steroids. And then when you release the steroid effect, then they both would come back up and they hopefully would be in balance. So hopefully, Simple Garden, that answers this question.
Siddhartha says, can they measure T helper 17 levels? Yes. So when the T helper 17 is become active, they also release cytokines. Plus T helper 17 cells have their own markers on them. That is what 17 is, CD17 or not CD17, but they have a specific cluster on them. So yes, we can actually see the cells or we can see their cytokines. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I used to say that there need to be new tests which can look at immune system's profile and say which cells are malfunctioning. Uh, I think that Dr. Bruce Patterson and Dr. Yo's work with the long hauler is kind of in that direction to create a new set of tests. But we need these kind of tests prevalent everywhere. Not only these will be useful for the pandemic, they will be useful for many other conditions as well. Yes, Kevin, uh, this is a great news. We have talked about it briefly before. Um, Carrie, Carrie Lynn uh, RN says, agreed. Thank you very much. Luffy? 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 <laughs> so I can't catch him. He runs away. Okay, so um, let's continue. Um, so Douglas says that not hearing much about bradykine and storm being a problem like cytokine prevalent. Uh, Doug, I have actually talked in detail about bradykine and storm as well. So if you just look at my uh, videos, um, if I go here, YouTube, and if I say Dr. Bean bradykinin, this is the one, bradykinin storm instead of cytokine storm. And then is hyaluronan in bradykinin and storm actually. So I have done some discussions here. Um, then let's see. Let me just answer a few more <laughs> uh, Twitter questions as well. So this is Matt, great idea. Thank you very much for this link. Uh, Roby Burton says, uh, how effective is the Pfizer vaccine with the results we are seeing in Israel? Peter Dosh, Doshi, associate editor for the BMJ, flagged up inconsistencies in the trial data that was released. Can you reflect on this? Yes. So number one here, Israel. So they are saying, and they have, they're doing a great job with the vaccine. This was interesting for me. Data from Israel so far shows that one dose of vaccine, one dose only, reduces infection rate by about 50%. And that is what we had seen with Pfizer that one dose only after seven or 10 days of the dose one, then the efficacy was about 50%, 48 something, 48 point something. At the same time, about 17% of those hospitalized for COVID-19 had received the first dose. So this kind of is an alarming statement that those who hospitalize, that means they kind of are becoming severe 17% of them are first dose recipient. But remember that after the first dose, when the innate arm is still working with the adaptive arm to make it work, it, that can take anywhere from 17 to 14 or now in some vaccines we are seeing up to 30 days to become effective. So if we are within this window, a full blown infection can occur. Now with this, then here is the um, other this is the BMJ revisiting the UK strategy for delaying the second dose. And here what they're saying is that the current UK strat strategy with Pfizer mRNA vaccine is, in our view, a non-randomized, uncontrolled population experimental study without pilot data. So they're correct because the data that has been produced was randomized, uh, placebo controlled and, and controlled. 
The problem is that the way they are administering the, the drug is different from the way they saw the results. So of course, that means that all bets are off for how the vaccine will work. I had done a, a discussion about this that ideally vaccine would still work, but when will the adaptive arm actually become ready? How much ready is still a question. So that is what they're talking about here. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization and Public Health England should be prepared to revisit and if necessary, reverse their decision based on the emerging scientific data uh, or evidence. At the time of writing, a statement released by Israeli officials had indicated that the real world analysis of 200,000 people greater than age 60 who have had the first dose, first dose of the Pfizer vaccine shows efficacy of 33% far less than 89% stated by JCV. This is important. So the JCVI, remember I was protesting that they're saying that even one dose can result in 89% efficacy. That can result in 89% efficacy maybe after a long time or maybe soon after for some time and then the titers go down. Meaning there is no real data there. And Israel has seen that that is not correct. Israel is looking at 200,000 people who got the vaccine and they're saying best efficacy data is 33%. And I would actually be on the Israel side here because vaccine is not tested this way. And then here is uh, Peter Doshi's uh, comment. And we had looked at this once in the past as well. And he's saying that the way data is presented, it is not really the best data. Um, my recommendation in this case is once again, administer the drug the way it is trialed. And why, so I understand why they're doing it. They're saying if we have 50 million doses, previously we were giving one dose to someone and keeping one dose in storage for them for their second dose. So that means 50 million doses actually means they are for 25 million people. Is UK in that much of a trouble that if they gave 50 million to everyone or whatever they have, let's say 20 million, to everyone as a single dose, then within two or three weeks, they cannot get another 20 million? If that is the case, then we are actually not ready at all. And then, yeah, sure, we have to have a problem. It's a similar thing that I'm seeing here in the US, US as well. OK, so um, 10 more minutes. I'm going to stay on the. Um, on the live side, let's just answer this more. Stephen Westman says, I hope to tune in. I imagine you have covered before, but could you comment on Novavax vaccination candidate? It is my understanding that the storage requirements are routine. That is correct. Is Novavax likely to trigger more robust immunity versus RNA? I think so. We don't have the data yet, but you are also correct that I have talked about Novavax. And the video title is, you will love this vaccine. And that is a Novavax uh, discussion. So uh, please, Stephen, look into that. And meanwhile, I'm going to be here now on the live side. And we'll just um, have 10 minutes here. And then we'll stop. And we'll continue the Twitter side tomorrow as well. So uh, Dragonfly says, uh, insights on co-vaccine and COVID shield in India. I'll try to see some data and, and talk about it. So Marie has a question here. Uh, what is your opinion about the effectiveness of monoclonal antibodies treatment for individuals who were recently diagnosed with COVID? So let's say bam lenny vimab With some restrictions, it is useful. And if given early enough, when the virus is still a target for the spike protein and virus is present, then they are, they are good. So they... I would take even Regeneron as well. I believe more in Regeneron because they are more than one antibodies. But antibodies are useful. Stephen says, thank you for covering my question. You are very welcome. Um, so there was a question. Karen says, how do you feel about Regeneron? I love it. Uh, Regeneron, Trump took it. Then Giuliani took it. Uh, FDA has approved it. So that means if you need it, you can ask them and they would provide it to you because it is now e it is now under EUA. Um, I love this one. Uh, 
<laughs> Morris, that is it. Uh, now, when the lecture would be finished, the discussion will be finished. He will actually sit down with me for dinner or other things. So he'll be totally fine. But right now, he knows I'm a celebrity and he's not going to be um, letting me uh, hold him. Gold Country says, you rock dog. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from Susie, the twit. What is your opinion on the various vaccines for long haulers based on the information we have? So I talked about that in the early part a little bit. Here is the deal. If it is a virus, and if we can promise that the vaccine can actually trigger the immune system faster than the virus itself had done, or more intensely than the virus itself has done, then maybe a vaccine can help. But if the vaccine, if the original virus did not cause much immune res response and it is just sitting there um, in lower uh, levels, then vaccine, I do not think vaccine would do anything better. But maybe I do not have the data and neither do the vaccines talk about it. Now, if the problem is the immune system dysregulation without the virus, then giving the vaccine would actually just trigger the immune system a little more. And then the person would feel symptoms of some more days, then the immune system would once again go back to that basal dysregularity. So over there, then the steroid-like thing is more important than the vaccine. So that means it depends what is the cause of the long hauling. So let's see if I can. Uh, so Stephen says, any research updates about COVID vulnerability blocking for known risk factors, for example, blood type, ethnicity, or so vitamin D like things are the most important, which can generally reduce the effect of uh, the SARS-CoV-2. But there are no further studies yet. <laughs> Ambal, you're correct. Yes. Luffy is, Luffy is something. Nowadays, uh, Luffy has found a new habit. He comes in and sleeps on me. And so he just, for the last two, three days, that is what he wants to do. El, you're very welcome. A question. I see that the new president Biden wears a mask, but he's already received the two vaccination shots. So uh, generally, somebody who's gotten the vaccination, they can look at their antibodies to know if they're protected or not. But let's assume that he's protected. I think it is a decent thing to do to still continue to encourage others to wear masks by him wearing a mask. So I actually, I am a masker. I'm not an anti-masker. So I actually appreciate anyone who is wearing a mask. So BLSR says, can you take Ivermectin and Regeneron at the same time? Yes. Regeneron's effect is on the spike protein of the virus to try to reduce the virus, uh, neutral, to neutralize the virus. Ivermectin's function is to shore up the cells and maybe also help reduce the viral load. So yeah, they can be given together. Uh, Terry, Listerine was also reported to neutralize the virus, but JNJ says, nope. Uh, yeah, so there is a study that I discussed as well, mouthwashes, not just the Listerine, mouthwashes and their effect. Cool. So 754. <laughs> Janet, you're correct. Luffy's <laughs> too demanding. Uh, Tara says, Dr. Bean, thank you so much for your generosity in videos to help us th through this time. You are lovely. If there is no risk in taking ivermectin, then why bother with, with the vaccines? So again, not known for the risk. So far, I have seen it to be safe. 
uh, I would still take the vaccine just to, if you're healthy, uh, taking vaccine would actually prevent the long-term use of uh, ivermectin. Cool. So last question and then we stop. Debbie, you are here. I have been missing you for some time. Uh, Debbie says, I don't believe immune system dysregulates for no reason without trigger cause. Where is the proof that body is rid of the virus suddenly and the stage of it may just run away and dysfunctioning, you, as you call it? Debbie, uh, it seems like uh, you are a little upset with my message. Uh, I would request you to read up on autoimmune diseases and why do they become autoimmune diseases. And in there, there are certain diseases that become chronic because it is the immune system that forgets to regulate itself correctly. Look up macrophage activation syndromes. So there has to be a cause in the beginning, for example, the virus itself. That was the cause. Then maybe the viral debris sitting somewhere was the cause. Then maybe a malfunction of the T helper 17 cells. So if you feel that this is not going to happen, then that is up to you. But you can actually go do this research by yourself as well. If you say that I am saying immune system will be dysregulated without the primary trigger from the virus, then I'm not saying that. There has to be a virus. If you are saying that hey, immune system would only behave that way if there is a virus present, then so far there are no studies that have proven it, that the virus is present in the folks who have the cytokine storms or who have the long hauling state. So if I take your uh, confrontation here and say you are saying immune system would only behave this way in long hauler because there is virus, then we should be able to prove it very easily. For example, to support you here, Dr. Bruce Patterson said he thinks that the monocyte continue to carry the virus. If that is the case, then the virus is the basic trigger. But it is not true in all cases. So what do you do in those long haulers where the immune system is still going nuts while there is the virus is not to be found. So then we got to figure out what's happening there. And and Debbie, uh, Debbie I would actually uh, ask you to go look up how immune system diseases work so that you can be a little bit more clear on this. Um, RB Long Holler says, my question got buried, but I had ivermectin in week two of COVID. It sounds like I should consider a new course along with a steroid pulse. Hypothetically, of course, yes, hypothetically, ivermectin with some steroid is actually a useful thing to do. Um, one last question and then we stop. Siddhartha says, if steroid treatment stops long hauling, then it cannot be the virus that causes the long hauling. So Siddhartha, that has been the case for my patients that when I give them steroid pulses, only in one case, I had to give two pulses in two months apart. But most of the time, once the patient has recovered and a month later, they say, you know what? I am still getting fevers and I'm still getting myalgias. And I give them the, um, um, the steroid pulses, they become okay. And for Debbie, once more, go read up on the chronic fatigue syndromes or myeloencephalitis, which are chronic states of the immune system after a viral disease had occurred. Margaret, thank you very much. Um, and... Cool. So let's stop here. Um, Shane, this is correct, that if you're too frail to handle the vaccine, you are too frail to handle the actual virus as well. That is correct. At least in theory, that is correct.
Cool. All right. So this is where we are at. Please like, subscribe, and share. There is a link in the description if you wanted to buy me a coffee. And there is also another link in the description if you wanted to just support my work. Thank you very much. Because the Twitter site is still uh, pending, I will continue with the Twitter tomorrow. So the open forum will continue. Thank you once again, and have a good night.